gateway. Let's stand together. Let's worship Christ, our risen King. See Christ. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. See me have them earth reply. Easter Sunday. We hope you are having a wonderful day thus far. We are indeed here to worship our risen Savior who has done so much for us, and we welcome you to Gateway Community Church this morning. You guys can be seated for just a moment. We're so glad that God has given us this day and that you are here with us, and especially today if you are our guest. If you've never been here before, let me introduce myself. My name is Thayer Stamper. I'm pastor here at Gateway, and I especially want to thank you for choosing to worship along with us on this Easter. Easter Sunday and we're grateful for every opportunity that God gives us and grateful that you are here as well I'm going to ask you to do something for us if you are here for the first time take just a moment just as a favor to us as a favor to me personally there is what we call a connection card in the row in front of you, you can take just a few minutes and complete that take it by the guest services counter on your way out this morning we've got something special we want to give you as our way of saying thank you for being our guest and then also if you want to do this online of course you are more than welcome to do so there there is a code, a QR code on the screen that's behind me. You can just whip out your phone, take that thing. You can be able to, to connect with Gateway Community Church through what we call the Church Center app. Grateful that God has given us technology, and technology is wonderful when it works, right? 
All right, we're grateful that this morning everything seems to be working. All right, so hey, you take advantage of that. Let us know that you're here. We'd love to be able to connect with you. And because today is such a special Sunday for us as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to read as our opening reading this morning from Luke's account of the resurrection. From chapter 24, we're going to read verses 1 through 7, or I'm going to read them. And I just want you guys just to listen. The scriptures read like this. It says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And the women found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Christ is risen. That was weak. Weak sauce, all right? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, all right? Some of you, some of you went to high church, all right? So you know what that's all right. The, re the, the rest of us low church folks, we, we're catching on with that. Okay, let's try it one more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Let's all stand together. Let's pray, and let's continue in our worship this morning. Father, we're so thankful that we do serve a risen Savior. We are thankful that he is indeed, as we used to sing, in this world today, and that we know that he is living no matter what others may say. And God, as a testimony to that truth today, we gather here in this place to worship him, to thank him for all that he's done, and God, to thank him for all that he's yet to do, but promised to do in our lives. So in gratitude, Lord, we come. We come to proclaim your gospel, that there is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved, that in his death and in his resurrection that Jesus has accomplished all that is necessary for our salvation. It is up to us to believe. Father, I pray that we would believe this morning. I pray that we would demonstrate that belief as we worship you with gratitude within our hearts. We love you today, Jesus. We thank you for all you are and for all you do. And we pray these things today in Jesus' name and for his sake and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, let's worship him.
cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever. the truth of God's word, 1 Peter 1, 3. Would you read with me? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. stars they wept the moon and stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world had fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon you. One final breath. One final breath again. As heaven loved me, the Son of God was laid. In darkness, a battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken, the ground began to shake, the storm was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is risen. The ground began to shake, the stones rolled away, His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeat forever. Forever He is glory. The 
sing hallelujah highest praise to the lord we sing hallelujah sing we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah, oh we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has
Father, this morning we come to you as a gathered people around the fact that the Lord Jesus, the only God, is risen from the dead. You went to the cross. You took our penalty. You took our punishment. You took our sin. And you put it upon yourself. You who knew no sin, a perfect sacrifice. And Lord, through your death, you atoned for us so that we may be the children of God. But the story did not end there. And we thank you and we praise you. That after three days, you, unlike any kind of religious following, unlike any kind of false God, unlike anything that man could ever think of, you, the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, you rose from the dead, holding the keys to death and hell. And you are our victor. You are our king this morning. And we look to you. We thank you for the message of that last song of the gospel. There is one gospel with one Lord, one Savior. Lord, may all call upon you. May all look to you. May all know you. This morning, Lord, as we open up your word, teach us through the Holy Spirit. Teach us, change us, transform us. Bring us closer and help us to understand you more so that we follow you as your people, as disciples. Thank you for this day. May we celebrate. May we know joy. May we know true peace in you, the risen King. And everyone said together, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. ask you this. How many of y'all came here this morning to get encouraged? Not a trick question. I'm just, 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 uh, just, just, just asking, all right? How, how many of you came to get encouraged this morning? Well, let me discourage you just a little bit. <laughs> Listen closely. Oh, you couldn't help yourself. I heard somebody go, all right. All right, hey, you know, you hear that, you have to finish it, right? Ha okay, how many of you, the, the worst thing in the world that could ever happen to you is to leave the gas pump, okay? To leave the gas pump and it have uh, 99 cent left on there without rounding up to the next dollar. I mean, you're, you're going to make sure that you pull that pump out and you're going to squeeze that last little bit in there. Why? Because you've got to see the zeros, right? Yes, even if it costs you more money, you got to see the zeros, all right? You, you, you got to see the zeros. How many of you like cliffhangers on your favorite TV shows? Oh, never, never, never. Music, you know, we, don't, we, we like to see the music, the harmonies resolve at the end of songs whenever we're going because if we leave you just hanging on a note where there's some dissonance kind of going on, your ear just goes, huh? Huh? What? What? How, how, can I, how can I go? Some of you don't know what it's like. Some of you don't know like what, it, what it's like to, to stop, a, let's just say, a game of Monopoly. How many of you have ever just stopped Monopoly just because you were tired of it? Some of you have never stopped, all right? We're going to keep going to the end. I was telling somebody the other day, our family tried to play phase 10 one time. I think we made it to phase 3. <laughs> we, 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 couldn't, we, we couldn't go through it anymore, but for some of you guys... It's not over until it's over, okay? It's not resolved until there's resolution. Listen, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. Because so often 
in our preaching of the gospel or in our understanding of the gospel. We leave it hanging. We leave it hanging because, of course, so much happens when we talk about the cross of the Lord Jesus. So much is going on there. And uh, when we talk about the cross, we're talking about the grounds of our forgiveness. We're talking about the grounds of us being brought into God's family, not just to be forgiven sinners, but to be God's sons and daughters through what Christ has done for us and by the giving of his Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. But folks, it's important for us to realize that as important as Jesus' death is, that's not the end of the story. Okay, It's not the end of the story because the resolution that comes in his rising from the grave, folks, is the promise. It is the, let's just say, it is the vindication of everything that he has done. And not just for what he has done in himself in rising from the dead, but in his promises to you and to me. Because the promise of the resurrection is that as Jesus lives, so also shall we, right? That's a huge truth for us to hold on to because we think about our existence here on this earth and we think about our physical existence and we try to think about heaven, but it's hard for us to think about heavens in terms of a physical existence because those that have gone on to heaven, at least in our understanding and according to our empirical kind of abilities, we can't see them. We can't experience them. We don't know what it's like over there where people just seem to live as spirits. And there's a reason for that. We can't fathom it because that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story because those that have gone on before us in faith in Christ will one day live again. Okay? The end of the story is not going to be your little life here on this earth. It's not going to be your death and everything is going to be over after that and you're just going to have this spiritual existence forever. No, the promise of God is that just as Jesus lives, so also, so also shall we live. And that's an essential part of our understanding of what it means to be a Christian is that we talk about life, eternal life, and eternal life is not just floating around. It's some kind of ethereal ghost. But you and I, are going to have glorified bodies one day, just as Jesus does. Folks, this physical existence is a part of our faith. It is a part of our hope. It is what we are looking forward to today. And whenever we gather here in this place, we remind ourselves that, yes, Jesus conquered death. But Jesus didn't just conquer death for himself. Jesus conquered death for you and for me. And that's not just some kind of abstract victory. That's very real for us to hold on to. That's why we can stand at a grave, at a funeral, and we can say these words. We can say, here lies the body of such and such. We can talk about the dates when they were born. We can talk about the dates that they, that they died. We can talk about the family that they leave behind. We can talk about the friends that we leave behind. And we can talk about committing their body to the ground, but we do so, and we close it with this, in hope of the resurrection of the dead, okay? That those that have gone on before us will one day live again. Folks, that is what we believe. That is what Christians believe. Even in our earliest creeds, when we talk about the Apostles' Creed, the resurrection of the dead is a very big part of it. Folks, you and I are meant to live forever. And all of us will live forever in a physical existence somewhere. Okay? Somewhere. That's the story of the Bible. But the truth of the gospel is that it can be with our God in glory, in perfection, forever. And that is the gospel that we proclaim, a gospel that gives us life and a gospel that gives us eternal life. And I want you to hold on to that today because any other gospel that tries to cut the story short, that ends with, okay, one day I'm just going to go to heaven when I die and I'm just going to live up there and I'm going to play my harp, all right? Folks, that's not the story. It's so much bigger than what we can imagine. But I don't want you to feel like, if you, if you just kind of think in those kinds of terms, I don't want you to feel like you're all alone. Christians have been struggling with this. Christians have been struggling like this, with this ever since they were Christians. Because we have this chapter in the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that tells us that the Corinthian church struggled with this. Understanding the resurrection from the dead. 
understanding the resurrection from the dead. Now, as Paul would go around preaching at these churches in the first century, understand that, that, that his understanding of the, of the resurrection was new and it was novel, at least for the Greek thinking people. Then so many of his churches are planted. Even Corinth is a Greek speaking culture that is very much influenced by, let's just say, philosophies that have come before them. And a man named, have you ever heard of Socrates? Anybody ever heard of Plato? All right? They have our Aristotle. It's like a quote the Princess Bride. Idiots. All right? <laughs> Idiots. And we can say at least when it came, at least when it came to understanding the gospel, at least when it came to the, understanding the gospel, that Paul is talking about the resurrection, these people couldn't understand it. Because as Plato is thinking about things, Plato thinks about, uh, hey, the, the, the material world is ultimately bad. All right? We need to get into the spiritual world. We need to get into the spiritual world, and that's why you would see people that, that would do all kinds of things to their bodies because your body didn't matter anymore. Your body didn't matter anymore, and it's why you could abuse it. And one, on one end of the, of the spectrum, uh, asceticism or just uh, masochism, or you could just give it everything that it wants, which on the other side is, is hedonism because, hey, it doesn't ultimately matter. And even the New Testament writers are wrestling with this. No, your body matters. Your existence on this earth matters because your God made your body, and your body is important to him. It's not the final destination. It's not the final body you're getting, but, but hey, take care of it. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul's wrestling with this, but he's going around, and he's talking about the resurrection from the dead, and they're thinking, oh, physical life again? No, that, that doesn't make sense. You can read about that in, first, in Acts chapter 17 when he's talking to the Athenian philosophers, and he begins talking about the resurrection from the dead. They think he's talking about a whole new God. All right? They think he's talking about a whole new God. Even when he's arrested in the city of Jerusalem, he's able to get out of it. Part of the way is because he makes the Roman governor believe that when he's talking to them, that uh, talking to the Jewish accusers that are going along with him, that he's, uh, this is just a dispute over religion because Paul, being a Pharisee, don't think that resurrection was new to Paul because Pharisees believed in the resurrection. Paul would say in the battle with the Sadducees, and they're always going against each other, that, hey, you know what? The resurrection resurrection this is just a dispute over those kinds of things the romans didn't understand it the greeks didn't really understand it and of course when you talk about the people in corinth they didn't understand it because they think hey we just live this life we live it out and then we die and then who knows what's going on faith is in christ and yeah we'll have some kind of spiritual existence with him paul says no that's not the gospel the gospel is that you're going to live and that your loved ones are going to live and you're going to be with God, not just as a spirit, but you're going to be with him forever and ever with physical existence. Because Jesus lives, we live. And any gospel that gives us anything less than that, folks, is an incomplete gospel. It's a cliffhanger. It's not over. So Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, almost the end of the chapter. He's only got a few more things to say after these words. And this chapter is tremendously long. It's almost 60 verses. As you go through it, you can see Paul's argument. And listen, it's not just that the Corinthians were wrestling with, with resurrection from the dead, understanding that. This, 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 let's just say this church had some severe issues, right? How many of you have ever seen uh, just off in the country somewhere a little church called Corinth Baptist Church? Uh, okay, well, listen, I'll just tell you, there are better names that you can give a church much better names that you could give a church because, hey, Ephesus is a great name for a church, all right? Don't name your church Laodicea, all right? That, that might be, a, that might be a, a bit of a problem as well. But, hey, you know what? You can call it, you can have the, the Corinth Baptist Church, but understand that if you adopt the name Corinth, you are saying that there's particular problems because this church is rife and it's full of problems. We just look at a few of them together. Listen, there's divisions within this congregation. You just go through, go through and see that they're fighting over who belongs to who and who follows who and Paul and Peter and then and, and later on a man named Apollos and some people would just try to say well I'm going to follow Jesus all right I'm going to follow Jesus and that, they did that not because they had any kind of humility they were just trying to trump everybody else in the in the congregate or trump everybody else in the congregation so yes there's all kinds of divisions that were going on moral failings moral failings especially in the realm of human sexuality listen Corinth had a reputation in the ancient world. And remember, when we talk about the, the, we talk about the first century uh, A.D., we're talking about the second incarnation of what we call the city of Corinth. 
back in the earlier days, a few centuries before that, uh, there's this thing uh, called the Peloponnesian War. Anybody ever heard the Peloponnesian War? Right, all right. A man named Thucydides wrote a wrote a, um, a few books about that. You can go back and see it. Now, Peloponnesian. I talk about that. That's not the kind of sauce that you get at Chick Fil A. That's Polynesian. I had I had somebody ask me for the Peloponnesian sauce one time when I went out there. But listen, if you're familiar with the geography of Greece. You've got the northern part, okay, and then you've got this little narrow strip of land, and then down on the bottom, you've got this huge land mass. The bottom is called the Peloponnesus, okay, and that little strip of land that connects the north and the south is really very narrow. It's very, very slim. It's called an isthmus, okay? You guys are familiar with isthmuses. That's a hard word to say because, you know, with the Panama Canal, it's the narrowest point. You build a place to go through so you can get the Pacific to the Atlantic and vice versa. Well, in that day, people wanted to do that as well. So you don't have to go all the way around the bottom of Greece. You can just go right through on this little narrow landmass. Well, hey, they tried it over and over and over to build some kind of canal there. They couldn't do it. But they finally built a city there, and that city was Corinth. And what they would do is they built a road from one end to the other. Or they would even build tracks that they could pull things across so that in your shipping you could go and take that shortcut all the way across. The city was very prosperous. It was very wealthy. And during that time of the Peloponnesian War, the Corinthians ultimately triggered that whole thing. They were destroyed later on. The Romans came in and said, this place is just a mess. We're getting rid of it altogether. But what the Romans like to do is to rebuild it. But they rebuilt it and they brought in all of the same kinds of problems. When you bring in this tremendous wealth, this tremendous kind of, of, of understanding of how economics work and how religion works, folks, you can do a lot of damage. If we talk about a city, talk about a city that had its problems. You can talk about temples to gods of all kinds. We're talking about a temple there to Aphrodite, okay, who is the Greek goddess of love. Temple prostitution a huge part of what's going on there in Corinth. You've got all of these philosophies flowing around. You have those who are tremendously wealthy right upside those that are absolutely poor. It would be like if you went to South America today and into Brazil and saw the favelas that are in Brasilia or in Rio. It would be that kind of social stratification. You throw all of these people together there in a church and you've got problems. And the morality in the city, to be called a Corinthian girl, okay, was to be called a prostitute, okay? That was the understanding of it all. These people are dealing with that. They've got relationships that are going on that, that are immoral just on other kinds of levels about relationships between uh, between. Um, the, your stepmothers and, and, and sons and things like that that are going on. And Paul said, hey, that's just absolutely just out of line. Things need to come away from that. Yes, these problems are going on, but you also have this, leadership problems. You have misuse of spiritual gifts. In fact, Paul is going to spend two or three chapters talking about that. First Corinthians 13 is our understanding of how you should use your spiritual gifts. We call it the love chapter, and we did a series on that a few months back. We talk about it as just being something that you would do at weddings. No, it's how to use your spiritual gifts. You use them with a spirit of love. Now, it's applicable to marriage, but it's ultimately about how to use your spiritual gifts within the church. You're talking about lawsuits between believers, and you have theological debates about what does marriage really mean, okay? If my husband is saved, am I, and, 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 and my, or let's just say my husband is saved, but, but I'm lost, how does that really begin to work? Or if vice versa, do I leave my unbelieving spouse? How does that really begin to work? So you've got that going on. You also are going to have sacrificial foods, like in the temples there in, in, in Corinth. People would bring sacrifices to, to, the, to the gods that, that are there in the city. And typically, the way that it would work is after you offered the sacrifice to the God, would you uh, be, be able, to, the, the vendors would come along and they would take the food and they, they would end up selling it there in the marketplace, all right? Was it okay for Christians to buy this food that had been once sacrificed to idols? And some people said yes, and some people said no. Eventually, the disputes are going to go into the point where they're fighting over the Lord's Supper, that people are coming to the Lord's Supper already full. Those that are coming are full, and not only are they full, but they're also drunk, and they're making a huge mess of everything. And when we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we did on Friday night for, for our communion service, listen, Paul is giving these instructions because there are these problems. 
But there's also this understanding, okay, this misunderstanding about the resurrection, all right? Let's live life now. Let's have a good time. These things are bleeding into the church, and the people don't really understand the gospel in all of its fullness. So Paul goes into this chapter. And when we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's kind of interesting, and we're going to do this for the next, the today is, is um, week one, six weeks after this. We're going to go through this chapter like this, okay? Just working our way through as we understand what Paul is doing. Paul introduces the resurrection as an essential part of the Christian life and the essential part of who we are and what we are to believe. In fact, he starts off talking about the gospel. If you've ever heard these words, it says that, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised again on the third day. Folks, that's from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul is explaining the essentials of the gospel, what it means to believe the gospel. And carrying on with that, he talks about how that Jesus was not only raised from the dead, but how he was seen, the proof for the resurrection, that he was seen by these, this person and this person and this person. And some of these people are still alive. And there are some occasions where he showed up with 500 people, and they all saw him. They all knew who he was. In fact, Paul said he even showed showed up to me one time. He showed up to me. I've seen the risen Christ. That's how Paul would call himself an apostle because you couldn't call yourself an apostle unless you had seen the risen Christ. He says, yes, he came to me as one out of, as I was born out of due season, as I was one that was just born after everybody else. He appeared ultimately to me. We know that Paul did see this Christ on the road to Damascus when he was saved. Paul says, Jesus is alive. Then, he says, if Jesus is alive, then how is it that some of you can say, and, and, and Paul takes a very, very harsh tone in some ways, how is it that some of you can say that, that you're not going to live again, that there is no resurrection from the dead? How can you say that? Your body is meant to live forever. Your body is meant not in this state to live forever, but your body, as God intends it to be, will live forever. And if Jesus lives forever, then you live forever. Jesus is not just going to be as a physical human being reigning over a bunch of spirits. No. You're going to see him, as John would say, and you're going to be like him. Okay? You're going to see him, and you're going to be like him. Follow, and then following after that, Paul is going to tell us what this looks like. And he's going to tell us, hey, you know what? Understanding resurrection is this. And this is where I think this resonates with you and with me. And I think why we need to emphasize this. It's not only that it's a part of the gospel, and that's a reason enough. But this is where you really need to understand where we're going with this. How many of you know that life is hard? How many of you know that life is unfair? Okay? How many of you know that life is unfair and that there's sometimes just nothing you can do about it? As Forrest Gump would say, sometimes in life, as Jenny's throwing rocks at her old house, there's just not enough rocks. All right? Because you can't fix the problems. You can't fix the problems. And you think about, let's just think about this, your health. Your health. Some of us today are blessed with good health. Some of us today are not as blessed as we once were with good health. For whatever reason, okay? Something may have happened to take it away. What about those that have never had good health? What about their existence? Is it meaningless? Is it they were just born to suffer? Just born to go through life with nothing? No, that in no way appeals to any rational or emotional part of us because people we long for something better we long for something perfect we long for something that is real and that lasts forever it appeals to that within us what about injustice in this world would you say that there are those that live as victims of injustice that will never, ever find any kind of resolution or meaningful resolution in this life? The victims, and we hear more and more and more about them every day, 
of this injustice. Those who have been cheated, those who have been robbed, those who have had their lives taken away, those who've had their purity taken away, but never have any kind of, in, in, any kind of justice in this life. And never have any kind of resolution. Folks, I'm going to tell you, in our hearts, we long for something more. We long for something better. But the grounds for us getting that is not just some hope that one day everything is going to be made right. It is a promise and an absolute sure promise that everything will be made right not because we hope for it, but because Christ has done it and completed it, and because he has done it, we have real hope. And Paul talks about this life, and we'll get into this a little bit deeper. He says, you know, the way that you and I are right now, corruptible bodies, corruptible bodies, the best of us. I mean, we're all corruptible. We're all going to die one day. You, sh- you, you have a shelf life. It may seem like your shelf life is really long. Your expiration date seems far out in the future. I'm going to tell you something. Mine did one day too in the past. It seemed a long way away. My expiration date is coming. Yours is too. Because one day we're all going to die, barring the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all going to die. Paul says that in order for us to put on incorruption, in order for us to put on that which is perfect, then that which is imperfect has to go away. It has to go away. Like a seed planted in the ground, the seed has to die to give birth to new life. This life is not all that there is for me. And one day what is corruptible will rise in incorruption, and that is the promise, because Jesus was raised from the dead. So shall you and I. Folks, Paul, encouraging these Christians along, and some of you are wondering, when is he ever going to read the Scripture? Is he ever going to reference the Bible? Folks, I'm going to read the Bible now, all right? It's just at the end of the service. But I want you to see these words that Paul uses to sum up. And he uses them, and we hear them all the time, and perhaps there will be churches in our very area, maybe just down the street, today they are going to use these words. But think about these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just look at verses 55 to 57. And Paul talks about, yes, death is going to be a part of our transition. Jesus died before he raised again. And barring the Lord Jesus' return, as we said, yes, your shelf life is going to one day come. Your expiration is approaching, and you are going to die. But in Christ, in Christ, there is victory. And Paul says this. He begins to sing. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? You may have temporary. Jesus is not going to last. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. You and I die because of sin. The power of sin is the law. The law reveals our sin to us. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory in Jesus. Maybe they ought to write a song about that sometime. You think so? Maybe. Maybe. I can think of some lyrics just kind of offhand maybe, but... But victory in Jesus, victory not only in this life, but victory over death. And you got to love, these words are not going to be on the screen, but you got to love how Paul ends this chapter. Not to give you the spoiler alert, but Paul's not just given some kind of theological treatise about what it means, what it means to believe in the resurrection. He closes out the chapter by saying this, okay, cause of these things be steadfast because of these things keep pressing on 
Because of these things, live in this hope. Because of these things, because of this gospel, you know what? Don't be caught up in these problems, these divisions, these moral failures, these misuses of spiritual gifts. Don't get caught up in all of that kind of stuff and let it hold you down when you forget that the gospel includes not just how to deal with problems in the here and now, but that our God has solved problems forever and ever. And if he takes care of death, he can take care of you. Be steadfast. Keep moving on. Folks, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. We believe and we are steadfast in the faith, remembering what Christ has done and that you and I have victory in this life and hope for the next. And yes, you will, in Christ, live forever. Live forever. You will know as you were known. You will have a glorified body. You will be in perfection, in perfection with our God. Folks, today, do you have that kind of hope? Do you have that kind of hope? I pray that you do. Because a gospel without the resurrection is an unfinished gospel. Trust in this Jesus. Take your next step in your faith today. Let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this place this morning to celebrate life, to celebrate new life, to celebrate life eternal. A life where there is no pain, no sickness, a life where there is no death. A physical life where there is no pain, no sickness, no death. No separation but to be forever with you. Lord, these things are not just aspirational hopes that we throw out there this morning. God, they are reality for all who are in Jesus Christ. So, Father, today, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we have this hope, that we live in this hope, that we can hold on to this hope in life's darkest moments. God, whenever we feel like giving up, I pray that we would be reminded of this hope. Father, whenever we find ourselves entangled in lesser things, as Paul often tried to extricate these Corinthians, God, when he comes to the part about the resurrection from the dead, because you have done these things, God, because you have done this work within our lives, then, God, we have hope in the midst of all other things. Father, today I pray that as Christians, we would never forget this hope, that we would live in this hope, and that it would sustain us as we are steadfast in following after you. But God, today we also know this, that there are those who do not have this kind of hope. Father, we're all meant to live somewhere eternally, but as of right now, that eternity in which we are to live is not with you. Because we've never come to the point where we've surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. Oh, we tried to clean our lives up before. We've tried to do things to make us more acceptable to you, God. But we've never come to the place where we've bent our knees to say that Jesus is indeed Lord. We tried to get to you, God, without surrendering to Jesus. And the Father, it's not that we don't live lives that please you, but it's just that surrendering to Jesus comes first. Father, I pray that within this room, if there is anyone here who has not come to the point where they understand and believe this gospel, that yes, we are great sinners, this who have no hope of coming to you on our own, but this Jesus who loves us came and died, not just for sins in general, but for my sin in particular, that he was buried and that he was raised again to new life. 
and that he was raised again to new life so that I, by my faith in him, may be forgiven so that I would be brought into your family so that I would have the hope of eternal life. God, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would impress upon that heart in such a way, God, that they would give themselves fully and freely to you and have this hope, a hope that transcends this life and a hope in a Savior who says it is finished and the finished gospel that leads us to life forever with you in eternity. Father, whatever needs to happen here in this place for us to take the next step in whatever faith journey that you're calling us along, God, I pray that we would take it by faith today. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you are indeed risen from the dead and you are Lord. We pray these things today in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, folks, we're going to let you guys go here in just a few moments, but we do want to mention just a few things to you. If you have any questions about anything that you've seen or heard here at Gateway today, find somebody wearing a name tag. We're happy to be able to talk with you. We'd love to be able to pray with you. We'd love to be able to introduce you to this risen Savior that we make so much of here at Gateway Community Church. We also mentioned, of course, next steps as a part of our message today. If, if you're interested in taking whatever next step that you must take in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be beginning or whether it be continuing on in the row in front of you, there's a connection card. If you could take just a minute, and I know I talked about that earlier with our guests, but if you're looking to take the next step in whatever faith journey that God is calling you on, take it fill out that card, take it by the guest services counter. We'll be glad to point you in the right direction or so you can just stop by the guest services counter if you have any questions today. We do want to mention just a, just a, a couple of things that are upcoming. Get your fridge door note. Uh, we've already got the, it's still March the 31st and March is still hanging on, but we've already got the April fridge door note ready for you. So you guys are going to go ahead and get that. You're going to notice a few things on there. We do want to highlight one thing. April 21st, at 5 p.m. here at Gateway Community Church, we're going to have a, a big fellowship meal. We're going to ask everybody uh, to bring a, a meat and either a side or a dessert, at least one side or one dessert, a meat, one side, one dessert, or you can bring multiple sides. Some of you don't know how to cook just one side, all right? That's, that's beautiful. That's perfect, all right? You bring whatever, but that's April the 21st. We do say that if you're coming, though, uh, be sure to let us know. You can do that on the Church Center app, or you can just stop by the guest services counter. We'll just keep a, a running tally. Just let us know how many are going to be here in your family as well. But as we get ready to go today, we pray that the Lord will give you a wonderful Easter Sunday. I know, pray that he already has, and I pray that Jesus would impress upon your heart how great a risen Savior he is. Let's all stand together. We're going to read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, and we will be dismissed today. The scriptures read like this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. One more thing. There is a place for a photo op. If you want to take a picture here at Gateway Community Church, be, feel free to do so. Love you guys. Happy Easter. <laughs>